I'm Marty Stauffer. It may seem strange to speak of fishes as wildlife, since they inhabit a watery world so different from our own. Mysterious and elusive, their ability to breathe underwater has mystified men for centuries. But when you think about it, it's water that makes Earth a livable home for all of us, from the immense Great Lakes to the tiniest backyard streams, America's inland waters support more than 700 species of fishes. You'd be amazed at how many are found right in your area, surviving by means that took as long to evolve as the waters they live in. Some are the familiar fish that many people enjoy catching and eating. Others are anything but ordinary huge primitive monsters or brilliant miniature rainbows and a few so unusual it's hard to tell just what world they belong to but whether we find them tasty or incredible they're all fascinating fishes for most of us the underwater world is as mysterious as another planet Many of its inhabitants seem alien as well. But water covers two thirds of the Earth's surface. And it is here that fish, the ancestors of all vertebrates, began evolving more than 400 million years ago. Some have changed little since then, while others have developed amazingly complex ways of life. Many fish are hunters, and most are hunted, not only by man, but by a wide variety of birds, mammals, reptiles, and other fishes. In the smallest pond or the largest lake, the shallowest brook or the most powerful river, each type of fish has a unique and useful place. Some fish feed along the bottom, others at the surface, and still others in between. Some, like these shiners and white bass, travel in schools with hundreds of their own kind. Some intermingle with other species, and some, like these striped bass, are most often solitary. A few fish don't look much like fish at all. The lamprey eel is the most primitive living vertebrate, and one of the most unusual, with its circular mouth, rasping tongue, and rows of sharp teeth. Parasitic lamprey lives by fastening itself to another fish, making a wound with its tongue 
and sucking the vital fluids from its host. The lamprey lacks scales and true gills, and its skeleton is made of cartilage rather than bone, but nevertheless, it is a fish, just as much as its more ordinary host. The sturgeon, another primitive fish, is North America's largest freshwater species. Record specimens have weighed over 1,800 pounds and measured more than 14 feet in length. Unlike birds and mammals, fishes continue to grow as long as they live. A very large sturgeon may have been quietly scavenging along a lake or river bottom for almost a century. The bow fin, with its full length dorsal fin, is another living fossil. It has two breathing systems, gills for breathing underwater and a swim bladder, which it fills by gulping air at the surface. Large and slow moving, the gar waits near the surface for whatever the current might bring. This long-nosed gar is one of four archaic species common in the southeast. All of them, the spotted gar, the short-nosed gar, and the huge alligator gar breathe through gills when active and use their swim bladders while basking near the surface of warm, oxygen-depleted waters. Like most other primitive fish, the gar is covered with an armor of tough, hard scales which do not overlap. North America's most ancient large animal is the paddlefish. 50 million years before the first dinosaur appeared on Earth, this fish was already cruising with its enormous mouth wide open, straining plankton from the warm waters of inland seas. As those seas dried up, paddlefish adapted well to the great rivers that were gradually left behind, especially to our Missouri and Mississippi river basins. Because of its large size, over six feet long in some cases, and its formidable appearance, this mild-mannered fish thrived for eons in a natural balance that included few enemies. Then, along came civilization. Suddenly, the fate of these ancient creatures has become uncertain. In the late 1900s, paddlefish roe were valued as caviar, though their meat was then considered worthless. But by the turn of the century, unregulated commercial fishing had drastically reduced their numbers. Today, snagging paddlefish during their spawning season continues as a popular sport, especially around Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri, where much of the remaining paddlefish population is concentrated. This one in the boat. I got it. Boy, that's a big one. A snagging season is permitted because, as bureaucratic logic would have it, the fish are effectively sterile. That's a big one, all right. But the only reason that they cannot reproduce is simply that they now have no place to do so. Not until 1960 did anyone discover the specialized conditions, spring floodwaters flowing over clean gravel beds, that paddlefish need for spawning. By then, it was too late. 
the Army Corps of Engineers had already dredged and straightened, channeled and controlled most of the rivers where paddlefish once had bred. In 1977, waters backed up by the controversial Truman Dam silted over one of the last remaining paddlefish spawning grounds. But the Missouri Department of Conservation was not willing to let the paddlefish disappear forever. After much experimentation, a way was found to induce artificial spawning. In the spring, a few dozen gravid females and mature males are carefully netted and held in hatchery ponds. When it's judged that her eggs are ripe, a female is injected with hormones taken from the pituitary glands of snagged paddlefish. This injection causes the female to release her eggs, little by little, over a period of about 24 hours, much as she would in the wild. At each stage, milk taken from the males is added to the eggs and the solution is gently mixed with a feather to maximize chances of fertilization without damage to the eggs. The fertilized eggs are carefully tumbled to simulate natural water conditions and to keep the highly adhesive eggs from sticking together. Can the same kind of engineering that doomed this ancient fish now save it? Can an animal that has survived the age of coal, the age of reptiles, and several ice ages also survive the age of technology? that our ingenuity and goodwill might help it to continue are a credit to our intelligence and our sense of responsibility. But that such artificial procedures are now the only means by which this amazing animal can survive is to me unspeakably sad. In fast moving currents, most fish, like these minnows, are able to rise and sink at will by using their swim bladders, as well as their fins. The lack of an inflatable bladder restricts these darters to the bottom of streams where they live. The darters are another group of fishes whose habitat is restricted by special requirements. Lacking an inflatable swim bladder with which other fish are able to rise and sink at will, these tiny members of the perch family are confined to stream bottoms. Their name comes from the way they dart about after food or away from enemies. Throughout most of the year, both males and females are quite plain looking. During the spring spawning season, however, the males of several species turn into some of the most vividly colored freshwater fish in the world. The females remain rather drab. As with many animals and birds and other fish, it is the male that gets the ornamentation. Biologists are just beginning to understand the vital role of these miniature rainbows in the ecology of healthy streams. Of the more than 125 North American species, most inhabit very regional streams in the eastern part of the country, from Florida and Louisiana, north to Pennsylvania, Ohio, and even Wisconsin. The tiniest fish in North America is called the least killifish, 
though it does not belong to the killifish family. Oddly enough, it's among those fishes that bear their young alive. It is closely related to the mosquito fish, another tiny live bearer with a reputation for consuming large numbers of mosquito larvae. Out west, in the Colorado River drainage, another live bearer, the Gila top minnow. Live bearers produce far fewer young than do fish that lay thousands or even millions of eggs. A packet of sperm implanted by the male is kept inside the female and used to fertilize several broods over a period of months. The young emerge able to fend for themselves, but the odds are still stacked against survival. Many are eaten by their own relatives. But the reason they are threatened as a species is because of habitat destruction and introduced competitors which prey on their young. The Gila top minnow was once one of the most common fish. Now, it's on the endangered list. Hopefully, some of these little ones will live to make their own contribution to the ecology of the few scattered springs where they're still found. One of nature's great mysteries is how salmon find their way thousands of miles from ocean feeding grounds to spawn in the same ancestral streams where their life began. As they battle their way upstream in this Washington State River, Pacific salmon begin to form mating pairs. The female uses her tail to sweep clean a nesting site, or red. The male stays close by her side as she deposits her eggs as many as 7,000 of them. Immediately, the male shudders as he releases the milt that will fertilize a new generation. The female will continue to guard her nest. But despite her vigilance, only about two of those thousands of eggs will survive to maturity. For the Pacific salmon, male and female alike, there is only one journey up the river of life. After spawning, they all die. Here in Maine, Atlantic salmon are another of nature's mysteries. Unlike their Pacific cousins, they often do live to spawn again. But their migrations are not easy either. As they leave salt water to go upstream, they give up eating entirely. As their sexual organs develop, they must subsist on stored fat deposits until they return to the sea, sometimes as much as a year later. Man is not the only creature that alters the aquatic environment 
Beaver dams create ponds, which are home to certain fish that could not hold their own in faster flowing waters. Here in northern Wisconsin, predatory species such as these smallmouth bass and walleye fare equally well in either lakes or streams. This thinner fish, which looks like a walleye, is actually a sauger, a close relative. The walleye is so called because of the frosted look of its eyes. These fish and many others find an extra measure of food and protection in the shadow of the beaver's dam. Some scavengers and bottom feeders, like the brown bullhead, prefer still or slow moving water where their food can settle. It's funny that we associate most catfish with muddy southern rivers, yet the brown bullhead, like many other fish, cannot tolerate silty or polluted water. This common member of the catfish family is found all over the country east of the Mississippi, from Florida to Canada, and has been introduced into other areas as well. The bullhead feeds mostly at night, feeling around for its prey with its sensitive chin whiskers, or barbels. Totally omnivorous, it consumes dead matter, plants, insect larvae, mollusks, even small fish. And of course, as every child with a cane fishing pole knows, worms. The burbot the only freshwater member of the cod family must be among the strangest looking of North American fishes. It lives in the deep cold waters from the Great Lakes northward to the Arctic. A voracious predator, the muskie is another cold water species. It sometimes finds itself in competition with the bluegill, the most common of the sunfishes. By melting Rocky Mountain snow, the Colorado River drops more than two miles in its steep journey to the sea. Through its canyons run some of the most turbulent waters on Earth. Several fish have evolved remarkable adaptations for surviving in these swirling sediments. The beautifully streamlined squawfish is one of the most successful. It's the world's largest minnow, weighing up to 80 pounds, which goes to show that not all minnows are small. Another is the bony-tailed chub, also superbly designed. Its torpedo-shaped body and humped shoulder help it fight the churning flow. Though its 15 inches are small, compared with the three to five feet for the squawfish, it too is large for a minnow. An unusual mouth and an even more pronounced hump characterize the razorback sucker. 
Its high, sharp dorsal ridge keeps it oriented in swift currents while it scours the bottom for food. At the Dexter National Fish Hatchery in New Mexico, efforts are underway to save these fish, much in the same way that the paddlefish is being preserved. The Colorado River and its tributaries have been dammed, diverted, and stocked with non-native competitors. Its original inhabitants, these unusual fast water fishes, are now endangered. But preservation under artificial conditions is not enough. Without clean, free-running waters, all wild fishes are doomed to be little more than zoo specimens. Their fate, quite literally, is in our hands. Fishes definitely qualify as wildlife. They normally thrive without human help, and they fight when caught. Like other creatures, they're also a real challenge to study in the wild. Fortunately, many of America's cities have a public aquarium where you can see, up close, what makes a fish a fish. Some of my favorites are in Chicago, Dallas, San Francisco, and the National Aquarium in Baltimore. There are others, and you should pay a visit to the one in your area. But these fish zoos must not become their only havens. Preserving the health of our free-flowing waters will ensure that they can continue living their submerged lives as fascinating fishes. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.